Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky, see your hand in time, in mind to lead me through the night. Last week we talked about peace and we prayed and leaned into the advantage of Holy Spirit peace. This week we're going to talk about rightness. Rightness. In Luke 24, 49, if you'll check this out and then a couple of verses and then we're going to be seated. Scripture says, Behold, this is Jesus talking. Jesus foretold, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Wait on the Lord until you are endued with power from on high. Turn to somebody near you and say, power. Boy, that was lame. Turn around and say to somebody else, come on, say power. All right. Romans 14 and verse 17. Scripture says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. How many of you in the house today, there's been times in your life that you were looking for some answers? There is rightness in the Holy Spirit. What is right is contained in the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to talk about rightness today. You may be seated. I appreciate very much so many in this congregation that help us to serve one another and to minister to one another every time we gather, whether that's in our small groups or in a worship setting like today. Our children's ministry was dismissed. We've got folks that give themselves to serving. We're interpreting in a couple of different languages. People give themselves to serving. The kingdom of God goes forward because people are willing to be engaged and involved. And I'm very grateful for those who do that. And if you're feeling the prompting right now to be involved on your way out, you can talk to guest services and tell them, I'd like to be involved and uh, we'll put you to work today. I'm going to say while I'm on that moment how much I appreciate my wife. I think she's stepped out. She's serving today, greeting people. You know, we were in college. She just fell in love with a boy. Having no idea where this journey of ministry would take us. And she is a wonderful Wonderful, wonderful human being, and I am grateful for her. While I'm at it, I don't say enough about my family. I, we love and appreciate our daughters. They didn't ask for any of this. They were just born into a preacher's family. We love them dearly and grateful for them. And these men who were bold enough to pursue them, even under the threat of a little bald preacher. (laughs) (laughs) We love these men, who they are, the way they treat our daughters. They're leading their families. We love them. They didn't ask for any of this. And there are aspects of my service that impact them that they never invited. Brother Rich, am I right? Sister Ramona, am I right? I love my family and I'm appreciative and grateful for them. All right, enough of being a sappy old man. 
Last week we, we attended to the Ephesian disciples in Acts chapter 19. These were good people doing everything they knew to do for 20 years or more. And then they meet the Apostle Paul. When the Ephesian disciples discovered through Paul baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, they they surrendered to that revelation and they were baptized again. They had been baptized under John's baptism They said, we see a clarity, we see a fulfillment we didn't see before, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. They were also filled with the Holy Spirit that for 20 years they didn't even know existed. But they received the Holy Spirit. How do we know they received it? Well, the Bible says they spoke in a language that they didn't learn and didn't know previously. We might think of this supernatural gift like this. We have thoughts typically as human beings and our mind, our brain, converts those thoughts into words. But when the Holy Spirit fills us, the evidence of that infilling, the reason we know is that our thoughts bypass our brains and the Holy Spirit redirects and puts words in our mouths. In Acts chapter 2 it says as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. It says in some newer translations, as the Holy Spirit gave them the words. We said last week we are going to invite in the coming weeks again and again. If you're a believer like those that were under the Ephesus believers, if you're a believer like those that we'll talk about today, and you're just doing the best that you've known but like the Ephesians and like we're about to find out in the house of Cornelius, you've not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus or received the Holy Spirit. We want you to recognize and know these are for disciples today. This is for us to know and enjoy and experience and We'd love to baptize you in the name of Jesus. We'd love to worship with you and see you receive this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit as well. A few practical things again about receiving. To receive the Holy Spirit, there's got to be faith. Every one of us has to come to the place that this is real and it's for me. This is real and it's for me. Everybody who receives the Spirit has to have that element of faith. There's got to be an element of repentance that we're sorrowful for errors, mistakes, and for our life direction. We change our course and we say, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus. He's going to set my life's course. Now, let me say this about any repentance when you and I ask God for forgiveness. Hey, I'm sorry I did this, said that, been this way, gone that direction. Scripture says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So having confessed and been forgiven, stop it. We can't be filled with the Holy Spirit while we're still repenting. We're not going to be filled with the Spirit while we're still apologizing. God will let that go. I'm sorry, I did it wrong. I, I want to, don't, don't stay in that place of uh, I'm a bad person doing bad things. You confess that, you ask forgiveness, you make a determination to change your direction, then let it be. Jesus will handle that. His blood on the cross wipes that away. Stop bringing it up. And then desire. God, God will not, does not. You're sitting here already today. And I've talked about the impact of the Holy Spirit. And you're thinking, I ain't felt nothing, preacher. That's not on God. God doesn't force himself on anybody. If you and I are not open to God in our lives, in our spirits and in our minds, guess what? He's not going to bother us. 
It's not about forcing people to follow Him. That's not the way He operates. Rather, it's an element of desire. And it looks like this. In Matthew 13, Jesus gave this parable about desire. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That's desire. Nothing else matters. That is what I want. In verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. That is something about that desire that says all of a sudden everything else going on in my life, everybody else I know, everything I own, everything I've been, everywhere I've been heading, that doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't have the value it used to have. Rather, I must have Jesus. I, I must be filled up with the Spirit. I I've got to have the power of God in my life. That's desire. And desire is displayed in worship. Focusing on Jesus. Let me ask you this about worship. What is it about Jesus that you admire and desire? What is it about Him that you admire and desire? And those are the things that you and I need to communicate. It's His love, His power, His purity, His mercy, His wisdom, His favor, whatever. In our own words, we communicate that toward Him from our hearts, how wonderful He is. That's what worship is all about. You don't have to talk like the psalmist David. There's nobody near you evaluating your sentences and structure. There's no one nearby saying, well, I don't know if I'd use that adjective. But if in your own words and from your own heart you'll communicate why you believe He is awesome, why He matters to you, why you are interested in Him. If we begin to communicate that, that's worship, which then leads into surrender. When I start in my mind and in my understanding expressing how amazing He is and how incredible He is, then I begin to recognize, wow, I need Him. And we surrender to him, Faith, repentance, desire, worship, and surrender. Talking about the Holy Spirit, a 19th century South African preacher wrote this. Beloved fellow Christians, this call comes to you in the whole church of the Lord. This one thing is needed. We have to to be filled with the Spirit. I might add that this is a man by the name of Andrew Murray. And in his 19th century South African pastorate, he had been a believer like the Ephesians and a believer like the house of Cornelius. And he come to recognize the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, this one thing is needed. We have to be filled with the Spirit. Do not imagine that you must understand it all before you seek and find it. For those who wait on Him, God will do more than they can imagine. You must taste the happiness and know by personal experience the blessedness of having Jesus in your heart. Can I get an amen from somebody? Let's look at the book of Acts and another example of those who tasted that happiness. In Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10. The Bible says in 10 and verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Turn to somebody nearby and say, he was a really good guy. About the ninth hour of the day, it says in verse 3, which is 3 p.m. in the afternoon, he saw clearly in a vision 
an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms, meaning his giving, have come up for a memorial before God. The Lord recognizes and acknowledges our sincerity. And then the Lord told him in this angelic vision, verse 5, Now send men to Joppa, send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, there's a lot of Simons, (laughs) whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Now that's intriguing to me. You got an angelic vision, a divine revelation. And that divine revelation is go talk to another human and they'll tell you about it. Go talk to another disciple and they'll tell you about it. I mean, am I the only one that wonders? I mean, you got an angel working here. Just have him say what's going on. Why the journey to Joppa? I'm going to tell you why. Because God was doing something bigger than just working in Cornelius' life. God was doing more than just reaching to Cornelius. He was going to teach Peter and some others. God was doing something Bigger. Can I just decide right now if you're wondering why God is working in a certain way in your life and it doesn't make as much sense to you as you'd like it to make? Can it be possible in our understanding? God is doing something bigger. He is coordinating something bigger than what's going on in just my life. Verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had departed... Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So then he had explained all things to them. He sent them to Joppa. And this vision that he had, Cornelius responded. He removed in the Lord's direction. And I want us to appreciate, he made a move and following toward God. He responded to the instructions when he still did not know the outcome. He did not have a full picture of what was taking place. He didn't know what Paul was going to tell him, excuse me, Peter was going to tell him about. It it was unknown to him, and yet he said, you know what? I'm going to go with what I know thus far. Like we read a few moments ago from the 19th century preacher, don't imagine that you must understand it all before you seek and find it. What's that called? It's faith. Verse 9, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's noon. The next day. Now, this is, this is just cool to me as well. God has already talked to Cornelius. Cornelius has already sent people to get insight. And God has not yet talked to Peter. These guys are on their way. And Peter hasn't yet got the call. Because God is getting some things done. In verse 19 of that chapter, while Peter is then, he receives a vision and he's thinking about the vision. The Bible says, The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter needed faith as well. Only the Spirit of God knew everything that was happening. He was the one in control, moving pieces and dying people and revelation and visions and angels and dreams. None of the individual players had a full picture yet. Verse 27, the following day, they're back in Caesarea and Cornelius is waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. He's waiting. Cornelius gets a vision. You need to send for Simon, Peter, 
He's with Simon the Tanner. He's in a city called Joppa. He gets his guys together. Now, here's what's happening in this Cornelius' mind. My guys are going to take about a day to get there. They're going to find the place. They're going to meet the man. They're going to stay the night. He's going to say yes, and they're coming back to our house. They'll get here tomorrow sometime. I need to get all my friends together, and he's waiting on them. What's that? Faith? Faith? that they're going to find Simon Peter, that this man really exists, and he's going to say yes to their invitation. And when he arrived, Peter discovered many that had gathered. And verse 25 says this, As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshipped him. A man of high military authority, running a big old household, falls down to worship Peter. Peter lifts him up and says, stand up, I'm just a man. Now the action was inappropriate, but the attitude was exactly right. Humility and surrender. He displayed it inappropriately, but humility and surrender toward the Word of God and the things of God is what has to happen in order to receive from God. And then we know Peter still doesn't know everything that's going on because Peter says to Cornelius, so uh, why the invitation? What do you guys want to know from me? What are you asking about? And so Cornelius tells a story about a vision and everything he experienced and how God is working all these things out. In verse 33, he said, so I sent for you and you've done well to come. Now, we're all here together before God, and we want to hear all the things commanded you by God. As we see all these pieces coming together from households and people and cities and journeys and dreams coming together, isn't it amazing how much the Spirit of the Lord wants to impact individual lives? Isn't it phenomenal what God will go to to get my attention and to get your attention and to see that we have what He's desired for us? Peter begins telling him about Jesus. He's Lord. He preaches Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In verse 44, the Bible says this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. If you want to, you can read John 7 at a later time, 38 and 39, Jesus foretold of the phenomena. 36, how did they know? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Same evidence, same display, same supernatural thing that happened to those apostles. I, I want us to appreciate the infilling of the Holy Spirit was not just for the apostles. It was not just for the preachers. It was not just for those who had some special call in their life. But Cornelius Cornelius is just a hungry man who wants to know more about God. He's been a praying, and God said, I want you to have what I have for you. Good people, praying people, baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost. All of that initiated by the work of the Holy Spirit, facilitated by the Holy Spirit, fulfilled because of the disciples' faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. And being filled with the Holy Spirit. This, this is the part two of the message. Like last week and in next weekend as well. So what do I get with the package of the Holy Spirit? What are the advantages? Well, there are lots of them, and I'm not going to preach on this every weekend until Christmas, all right? There are a lot of them. But I'm going to talk about a few, and the one I want to talk about today, if you look at this advantage in Romans 14, 17, 
The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness. In a message I preached not long ago, and in some faith groups we had in the book of Romans, we recognized two aspects of righteousness. Righteousness in status and righteousness in practice. Rightness in status and rightness in practice. A disciple's status is in the eyes of God. When he sees us, when he looks at us, are we righteous? Are we right in his sight? And a disciple's practice is our transformation into his image. Status and practice are throughout the entire Word of God. Throughout. In the Old Testament, they had practices to attempt to earn the status. And they always failed. Practices to try to earn the status, and that didn't work. So Jesus comes and He just flips the priorities. Listen, that way ain't working, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the status that empowers you for the practice. Now, we have a hard time with that. In our world, we... (laughs) You don't get a raise until you earn the raise. And a manager's out of his mind to just kind of give an employee a raise and think, well, now they'll work harder. Yeah, we we don't operate that way. Well, if I pay them twice as much, they'll work twice as hard. Not likely. And so we have a hard time with Jesus coming into this world and saying, look, I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be buried in a tomb. I will rise again on the third day so that you can be forgiven and you can be cleansed and you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Your status will be right. And then we get all confused and think, well, I got status, then who cares about practice? Well, God, Christ Jesus. If if practice doesn't matter, then a lot of the New Testament is wasted paper and ink. So Jesus didn't eliminate those states of rightness. He didn't come to say, I'm eliminating practice. No, no, no. He just changed the order. I'll give you status. Now you'll be empowered to practice. We are still to be transformed into His image. Day by day, year by year, we are to become more and more like Christ as we follow after Him and the Spirit works within us. That's the process. The rightness. Now, I'm not going to talk about in this message the status other than what I just did. I'm going to talk about the practice, the rightness practice. The rightness practice. Jesus changed the order, but he never eliminated either of them. And by the Holy Spirit, I want us to get this. This is our advantage today about rightness. I can know what's right and have the power to do what's right. The Holy Spirit. I can know what's right and have the power to do what's right. Folks, unless you've been living in a cave somewhere or in a hut out back in the Cascade Mountains, there's an increasing need for discernment in our era. To be able to decipher what's good and bad and right and wrong and true and false. There's an overwhelming amount of information available. Tell me, isn't it humanly impossible to process all the information available in our world? Now some people are going to say, you know what, I'm not even going to fool with it. I'm just going to rely on artificial intelligence. And it'll give me all the answers. I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to abandon my God-given reasoning to a machine. 
more concerning is that it seems that nothing is absurd anymore. Practically all ideas and concepts and beliefs are considered valid. How are we supposed to know what's right? Should we just, you know, believe what's convenient? Should I just believe what I always thought was right? Should I go with what's popular? Should I go with what's socially acceptable? Should society define what's right and good and true? You know, it seems to me we're leading our lives, we're leading our families. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that on assumptions. It's eternally important. In our world today, here's what truth seems to me to be. You just say something loud and boldly and you keep repeating it. Just say something loud, say it boldly, and keep repeating it. As long as you can keep a straight face, that's what truth is. That is not necessary. Supporting, am I right? You know I'm right. Loud, bold, and repeated. If somebody calls you on the facts, you just double down louder, bolder, and repeat it. My friend Dallas Brock said this, opinions are not proof. So in the environment we live in, this is what's happening. Our society is choosing who to listen to. And if their who says it, then that's what they're going to believe. Christians choose Jesus as our who. That's what differentiates. That's what separates. Jesus is our who. And the Word of God is His revealed truth into our lives. You know what? It never changes. It's always the same. I, I can count on this. I can depend on this. For centuries it has existed and been faithful and true. It doesn't change with political environment. It doesn't change across culture or language. It doesn't change across continent. Around the world, this remains the reality revealed Word of God. Jesus is our who. So we agree with the psalmist in Psalm 19, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. The Word of God is established. Are there difficult things in there, preacher? Well, yeah. Well, what do we do about that? I keep looking at this and let it explain itself, and then I do this. I trust the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me uh, into all truth. When I'm struggling with some of this, I, I don't give up and I don't quit and I don't write it off. I, I surrender to the advantage of, of the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide into all truth. How do you get there? Well, Jesus... Go figure. John 14 and verse 16, the Bible says this. Jesus speaking, I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper. Some translations say comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, what is that? The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Why did Jesus say, will be in you? Because in John 7 it says, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit's role in our lives came after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
John 16 and verse 13, Jesus continually speaking, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. There's our advantage right there. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit directs us to rightness. In a society that is filled with all manner of concepts and convictions, disciples of Christ lean onto the Holy Spirit to guide us into what is right. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps us from being deceived. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps us from being confused. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth and it allows us to know rightness. The kingdom of God is more than knowledge. It's practice. It's practice. Look at what Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. We're going to pray here in a minute. I'm almost there. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. What's that talking about? Forgiveness and remission of sins. That's what it's talking about. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk by my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. There's the change. Status and practice got flipped. That's what's being prophesied. I'm going to give you the status and by the power of the Spirit you'll be able to follow the practice within you and cause you. Again, I reference the preacher Andrew Murray. He made this observation and I've been chewing on it since I read it. A strong will is necessary for a strong faith. A strong will is necessary for a strong faith. I, I'm, I'm going to be very direct right now. I don't want to be mean, but I'm going to be very direct. If I can't hold a job, I will not be able to serve God. If I can't brush my teeth every morning, I'm not going to be able to serve God. If I can't require my household, my children, to do right things and to do certain things, I, can't, I don't have a strong will. Are you with me? I, I can't, you know what? I only make every two or three payments on my car. It's going to be tough to serve God. You want to know why God's interested in finances and tithe and offering? It's a reflection of will. All right, all right. It takes a strong will to be a strong Christian. Amen. And if you and I are people that are giving in all the time, it's going to be tough to serve God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm in the people business, and that truth makes me sad. It seems to me that then there's this big old part of society that won't be able to succeed as a Christian. And I want us to understand the Holy Spirit gives us the advantage that we need. The Apostle Paul recognized this. He's praying for the Ephesian disciples in Ephesians 3.16. Look at how Paul's praying. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. 
that you and I would be strengthened on the inner man by the power of the Holy Ghost. In my own personality, in my own being, uh, I'm not strong enough to follow God. Uh, I don't have the strength of will to follow God. But when I'm filled with the Spirit and I will lean into the Spirit, there is a strength of God that lets me succeed when I wouldn't succeed before and it lets me follow Him when I wouldn't follow before. When I lean into that Holy Spirit advantage, uh, I'm able to be animated and empowered in my will to follow His will. And here's where I'm going to provoke just a little bit today. Hearing the sound of my voice, hearing right now, watching online, you find some struggling with serving God. Are we leveraging this advantage? If not, what are we doing instead? What are you and I doing when we lack the strength to do what's right? How are we dealing with our moral weaknesses? I don't have any moral weaknesses. Liar. We all have moral weaknesses. And when they sneak up on us, and that's how it always works, right? None of our moral weaknesses announce themselves before they come in. Hey, tomorrow afternoon, I'm really going gonna, gonna to be attacking you. It's not the way it works. They sneak up on right? What are we doing when those moral weaknesses sneak up on us? I don't want to be mean, but I do want to be direct. I want to be clear. If we're not leveraging the advantage of the Holy Spirit, it's no wonder that we fail. It's no wonder that we trip up. Because in ourselves, we don't have it in our human possibilities. But if we will leverage the Holy Spirit, I don't know, what are we doing? Some of us just ignore the call of God. Well, this thing is really calling me to some things. Well, if I just don't read it, I'll be good. Well, the Word of God is really pressing me in some particular areas that are tough for me. Well, you know, deny it. We talked about that last week. Why would a disciple look for reasons to deny the Holy Word of God? I don't get it. Hide from it, procrastinate. Perhaps in America not in other countries as blessed as us, but in America, we like to escape. It's binge watching, or gaming, chemicals, porn, whatever. Those things do not help us practice kingdom rightness. But disciples, what do disciples do? We turn to the Holy Spirit Advantage. It is said in Ephesians that we be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. That's something that many of us should probably memorize and be ready to quote every time our moral weaknesses sneak up on us. I'm going to be strengthened in my inner man by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not giving in. I'm not going to be tricked. I'm not going to be cheated. I'm not going to be deceived. I'm going to call on the power of the Holy Spirit within me so that I might follow after Him. In Ephesians later on, he wrote this, to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I don't think I can do it, preacher. Same is true for everybody in this room at some point in time and for everybody who calls themselves a Christian. We don't live in faith all the time. Doubt sneaks up on everybody. But what are we going to do with that doubt? I'm going to lean into the Holy Spirit and recognize He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. I don't think I can do it on my own. Doesn't matter. He can do it. He can do exceedingly above what we ask or think. Stand with me across this room right now. 
Just straight on, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit in this place. We're going to pray as a body of disciples, front to back, side to side, right where you are. I'm going to invite people to come forward here in a minute, but we're going to first start out right where we are in a time of prayer. In this room full of good people. Sincere people. We're going to be able to start praying and confessing to the Lord, this is real. And it's for me. And I want Jesus. And I want to follow Jesus. And we begin to admire Him and to express why He is awesome and wonderful. Even while I'm talking, there's hands going in the air right now. Why don't we join them right now? Come on, begin to open up our minds and our hearts right now to express. Come on, mom and dad. Come on, young adult. Come on, those that are on their own, those that are yet to be on your own. Begin to call out to the Lord right now. Begin to open up our minds and our hearts to say, Jesus, I need You. I need Your power. I need Your wonder. I need your glory. I desire, Lord, the fullness of your work in my life. Come on, that's beautiful. The Spirit of the Lord is already sweeping into minds and hearts. The Word of God is true and it's being validated right now in households. It's being validated right now in men and women. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series or join us online at livingfaithministries.church Ghost.